Hello and welcome to another lecture in the Abralinha ao Vivo series. Abralinha ao Vivo is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. Today, I'd like to introduce Kope von Urk. Von Urk is a, a senior lecturer in the linguistics department at Queen Mary University of London. Re his research looks at issues in minimalist syntax with a particular focus on understudy languages such as Dinka, Fingian, and Amir. The title of his lecture is Dunka Plural Morphology is Con Concatenative and Regular. Before we start, I'd like to thank you, uh, Kop von Urk, for accepting Abraham's invitation and to, and to say that questions and comments are very welcome in the chat. Please join me and welcome Kop von Urk. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Let me uh, share my screen. And all right, there we go. Um, so, yeah. Uh, right. Okay, there we go. So, thank you so much for the uh, invitation. So, um, I'm going to be talking today about Dinka uh, number morphology. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Zhou Yi's son, um, uh, one of my students at, uh, at Queen Mary. Um, and this is uh, kind of the one of the, this is work in progress. This is very new. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to getting some uh, feedback on it. I thought it would be the most fun to share something I've been working on very recently. Uh, this is one of the things that's been keeping me distracted during this uh, pandemic along with my my daughter who's a, who's a few months old. Um, so yeah, so let me uh, get started. Uh, I should note that the handout for this talk is available on my website. You can either copy this link to download it if you are if you want to uh, go through it, or um, uh, you can just navigate to my website and it's under the, the talks as well. Um, okay, so let me uh, let me start. So uh, Dinka is a, a nilotic language spoken in, in South Sudan, which has been um, cited as a particular challenge for item-based approaches to morphology, concatenative, uh, fully concatenative approaches to morphology, because much of its inflectional system in the nominal and verbal domain is expressed through uh, changes to uh, to the root, uh, mainly um, alternations in the in the vowels. Um, so, for example, uh, in the um, uh, Plural, for plurals in the nominal domain, as in uh, 1a through uh, g, uh, you see that there are a variety of changes to uh, that mark the difference between a singular and a plural form. So you see a lengthening in 1a, you see a change in uh, voicing to a breathy voice vowel as well as um, uh, in, in 1b, you see vowel lowering in 1c, you see apparent shortening, um, you see apparent um, um, vowel lowering again in one uh, E, vowel raising, uh, and, and so on. You get a lot of different changes. Um, and these changes frequently, uh, as well as changes in tone in a lot of these forms, uh, but sometimes not. And so these changes frequently do and do not co-occur, um, potentially requiring a sort of multitude of uh, floating uh, uh, affixes in a concatenative uh, model. Now, this number morphology is uh, particularly uh, difficult because it's been argued to be uh, essentially irregular uh, in a, a, a paper by um, uh, Robert Ladd, Bert uh, Remais, and, and uh, Kagor Adong Manyang in 2009, uh, raising the question of whether we can really even posit any consistent affixes. Um, so in this talk, what, I, what we want to do is show uh, that Dinka plural morphology, despite the uh, initial apparent complexity, is nonetheless a, a straightforwardly concatenative and also actually a regular uh, a pattern, uh, as long as we recognize uh, a number of declension classes. Okay, um, so what is this going to uh, look like? Um, so there are uh, two key components to our analysis, which I'll briefly review here. Um, so first um, is the claim, which is uh, by no means a, a new one, that uh, Dinka has a tripartite number system. Um, so many nilotic languages have uh, this kind of number system. 
in which uh, nouns uh, are marked in one of uh, three ways in, uh, in terms of number morphology. Uh, we get nouns that surface with a number marker just in the plural, like warthog in two here. We get nouns that surface with a, a number suffix just in the singular, uh, and nouns that serve, serve, uh, surface with um, number suffixes in the singular and the plural. Um, and so I'll use the terms uh, inherently singular, inherently plural, and numberless for these. Uh, so we'll, we'll claim that Dinka has this uh, a type of, of, of system, uh, as, as many people working on the, on the language uh, do. Um, in addition, we're going to identify three types of uh, floating affixes, uh, which attach to uh, the root, uh, but are integrated into it, uh, and that, which mark both singular and plural. So um, I'll, I'll briefly go through what these look like. The first type of floating affix we're going to posit is one uh, that contributes a, 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 a two units of, of weight, essentially, that lengthens a vowel to a long trimoraic vowel. Uh, so you see this here for three, uh, it, where a, an, a singular root is lengthened to a long vowel in the plural. This also happens for some nouns in the singular, where a plural root is lengthened to a long vowel in the singular uh, for elephant and dove. So this is going to be uh, one, one set of nouns we'll identify. Uh, another set of nouns will show uh, vowel raising and lengthening to a mid bimoraic vowel. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Copley. Yeah. Uh, some people in the chat are uh, telling that the PDF is still on page one. So maybe oh. you have to click on, on the PDF and then scroll down. Uh, no, yeah, I don't, something seems to have gone wrong. Um, let me just, something seems to not be working. Okay, um, let me just stop sharing. Um, okay. Um, is this fine? Uh, I don't know. This can you to... try to, to move it? Yeah, it's now we can see. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm very sorry about that. There seem to be something, my full screen seemed to be frozen for some reason. So I'm just going to stay in, in this mode. Um, yeah, so the, uh, okay, so let me briefly, yeah, so you can see, I talked about this tri tripartite number system, where you see here are these examples where um, you have an affix just in the plural, and you have an affix just in the singular in and, and both, uh, both cases. Um, so uh, hopefully you can uh, briefly scan that. Um, uh, right, and so we, and then the second ingredient for this analysis is these three types of floating affixes that mark uh, singular and plural in Dinka. I'll just go over this because I left a little bit of uh, stretch in the, in the talk. So um, uh, let me just go over this again. So um, the first type of floating affix we're going to posit is one that lengthens a root to a long uh, trimoraic vowel. So you see some examples of this in three. Uh, we will see that this happens in the plural. Some roots uh, lengthen from a, a short uh, vowel or medium vowel to a long vowel. Uh, we'll see that this happens in the singular as well. There are some forms where a, 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 a plur an in inherently plural root, so one that only has marking in the singular, will lengthen to a long vowel. The second type of uh, floating affix um, that we will posit is one that triggers vowel raising and lengthening to a mid bimoraic vowel. So we see the vowel raising here in five uh, from a to e, right? In, in all these cases, um, here there's, for, uh, this is to a. Um, so this is vowel raising and we get lengthening with a short form. A short form will lengthen to a, a mid vowel, uh, but with a mid underlying mid vowel, uh, you don't get any lengthening because the, the lengthening is, is always to a, a fixed uh, mid vowel. And you see the same happening in the singular here in six. Um, so you get vowel raising again from a to e, uh, and as well as lengthening with a short vowel and uh, no lengthening with a, with a medium vowel. The third type of floating affix we'll, we'll introduce is one uh, that triggers vowel lowering. Um, so you see here uh, these vowels lower uh, from the root to the marked form and the same pattern of lengthening, lengthening with a short vowel uh, and no, no change in length with a mid vowel. Um, and you see the same thing happening from the plural to the singular in, in eight. So these are the six declension classes we're going to posit, and we're going to show. Uh, and as long as the as long as we allow for an affix specific ban on long vowels, as long as we allow for these 
four classes to uh, not permit lengthening beyond a mid-vowel. These processes are all straightforwardly additive, they're concatenative. Uh, and in addition, we'll show that each of these processes represents a, a coherent declension class within which alternations in tone are, are regular, they're not, they're not unpredictable, um, and uh, even some alternate, mostly the alternations in voice are predictable as well. Okay, so um, yeah. Before uh, getting into some of those details, let me give you a little bit of background on, on Dinka and Dinka morphophonology. Um, so, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, constraints on, on Dinka roots. So, Dinka is a nilotic language spoken in South Sudan, as I, as I mentioned. I'm gonna we're going to focus here on the Langjuang um, dialect uh, because it's particularly well described uh, in a series of papers by uh, Bertrand Meissen and uh, Robert Ladd and uh, Kagur uh, Adongman Yang. Um, and we're going to make use of the, of, and there's also a very good uh, corpus of uh, singular plural pairs uh, that, that they elicited um, from this dialect, which we're going to make use of unless uh, we provide a source, all of the data is, is taken from there. Um, so uh, uh, Dinka roots are generally uh, monosyllabic um, with a, an obligatory onset and an obligatory uh, coda consonant as well. So you see this in uh, 9a through h. So in on the left hand side, you see a bunch of different nouns of different shapes and you see that they're all uh, monosyllables. It's very typical for Dinka roots and they have a, an, an onset consonant and a, and a coda consonant. And you see the same thing for a range of um, uh, non-finite verbs uh, in the, uh, on the right hand column as well. So uh, on the basis of, of this, uh, uh, Torben Anderson, as well as uh, uh, for the Agar dialect, as well as Bert Remeisen and, um, and Kukwar Adam Manyang provide uh, this template in 10 for uh, Dinka roots, um, where uh, the basic shape of a Dinka root looks like, looks like this with an initial onset, some um, optional glides, um, then the, the vowel nucleus and, and an obligatory coda consonant. This vowel nucleus can be quite complex because there, a, there are a range of different uh, contrasts that can be expressed there. Uh, so first of all, as you can see in this template, there is a, a ternary contrast in length between uh, short vowels, medium vowels, and uh, uh, long vowels. So you see some uh, near minimal uh, triplets in uh, 11. Uh, there are some uh, uh, changes in, in tone here. It's quite, it's um, pretty much impossible to construct perfect uh, uh, minimal triplets, but um, this uh, distinction is um, uh, you know, present all over the nominal and, and verbal domain. Um, in addition to this, there are uh, four tones, at least in this dialect, uh, high, low, uh, rising, and falling. Uh, and also there's a binary contrast between uh, modal uh, or creaky voice, which uh, we uh, leave unmarked, uh, and, and breathy voice marked with um, uh, this of sub umlaut. Um, the, this contrast is present for uh, all the all the vowels, as you can see in these in these pairs here, except for uh, ooh, which doesn't have a uh, modal creaky uh, counterpart. And uh, following the conventions in the in the literature, uh, we are going to mark a voice uh, and tone only on the first vowel uh, throughout. Um, right. Uh, there is one class of polysyllabic nouns, which you will see in the examples uh, over and over again. Uh, these are, are reasonably common. Uh, they are prefixed with uh, a, so they look like uh, 13. Um, uh, you can see a bunch of them here. Uh, these are uh, likely, um, this a is probably likely a nominalizing morpheme of, of some sort. Um, it, for example, uh, with some of with some of these nouns, uh, for example, messenger, uh, this, the, the, there's clearly the the, this is clearly ah attaching to the, the verb send, uh, but with others, uh, this is non-transparent and it's um, uh, either, either the root is uh, nominal in nature or um, is not uh, clearly attested as a distinct root. Um, but the main point about, so, you know, you can probably mainly e treat these as either monomorphemic or involving some sort of uh, spell, uh, ah as a, some sort of spell out of little n or something like that. Um, but the main point is that the final syllable of these nouns uh, expresses the same range of contrasts as monosyllables. So all the inflectional changes uh, happen in the final syllable. So for all sort of intents and purposes, we can treat this uh, class of nouns as, as similar to the, the, the monosyllabic class. Okay, um, right. 
So yeah, so a little bit of uh, detail on, on previous work. So in both the, the nominal and verbal domain, Dinka exploits these uh, contrasts in the vowels to express inflectional uh, morphology by utilizing changes in uh, vowel quality, in length, in tone, as well as in uh, voicing. Um, in the verbal domain, the patterns are actually quite uh, regular. Uh, there are a couple of different tonal classes uh, that sometimes interact differently uh, in, in different parts of the uh, paradigm, but um, it's a very regular pattern. Um, uh, but it's been noted that Dinka plural morphology is particularly irregular um, because plurals can be marked through a large variety of changes. And there's another, um, there's another summary uh, uh, here in 14a through h. I won't go through all of these, uh, just to note that there are also uh, some uh, irregular cases like uh, suppletion in 14g, uh, for the noun for woman. And there are also sometimes changes in the coda consonant exceptionally as well, uh, probably um, a, a relic of um, um, uh, uh, you know, older, older suffixes uh, as in h. Um, uh, so there's a, um, a, a, a well known, a, an important paper on this that investigates regularity in, in this corpus that we'll be using where they note that there are 81 different combinations of change uh, from the singular to the plural. There really are a lot of different um, uh, pairs, but the most common one occurring in uh, only 12% of nouns. Uh, and uh, on that basis, they conclude that plural morphology is uh, in essence uh, irregular, um, right? Uh, now, I should say that there is a, a recent paper that I've, I've become aware of in the, in the last couple of days, so I haven't had time to sort of fully digest, which I've, I've done my best to sort of do justice to here. So there's this, uh, this is a really nice paper by uh, Robert Ladd and Marella Blum uh, with a kind of converging view that there are important subregularities in the uh, Dinka number morphology, uh, and they end up pr proposing a view uh, for the same data set that's, I think, importantly similar uh, to, to what we're saying. I'll try to highlight throughout where they make a, uh, where their proposal is similar and where we diverge. Um, so uh, I hope I've done this justice. I've only, um, um, uh, they, maybe they can correct me if I get anything wrong about this proposal in the question period. Um, um, but yeah, so I've only had a few days to digest this, so, so I hope I've done it justice. Okay. All right, so let's walk through. Uh, so the key question here is, can an inflectional system be truly fully irregular? Uh, and so we're gonna try to uh, argue uh, that this, this doesn't need to be the case. So let me introduce the key ingredients in uh, making sense of this. Uh, a lot of this, this uh, these are two uh, key ingredients we need to understand that come from uh, a lot of re uh, previous work on Nilotic as well as, as well as Dinka. So a first step in making sense of Dinka morphology is to adopt a synchronic tripartite number analysis of Dinka. Uh, contra uh, uh, Anderson's conclusions, who argues that this is, uh, that Dinka was historically tripartite number, but we think it's synchronically uh, uh, still is. And so, but it's, but clearly all authors agree that the complexity of Dinka plurals derives from the fact that the number marking system comes from a tripartite number system of overt affixes that were lost. Um, right, so just to uh, review again, the um, uh, tripartite number system, there are three patterns of, of number marking, inherently singular nouns, which have only an affix in the plural, inherently plural nouns, which have only an affix in the singular, and numberless nouns or replacive nouns with suffixes both in the singular and the plural. As kind of number system is uh, frequently grounded in some semantic uh, generalizations, much like gender systems, uh, where inherently plural nouns, for instance, frequently refer to entities that naturally occur in pairs or pluralities. So their unmarked uh, sort of occurrence in the world is uh, as, as a plural. So wings, for example, are obviously uh, often a dual in, in, in the world. Um, whereas inherently singular nouns are referred to items and individuals that, that tend to occur in isolation. Uh, I don't really know whether this is particularly true for uh, war the, the warthogs that are being referred to here, although male warthogs are solitary. I did look that up. Um, uh, but, but this is the sort of general semantic basis of this. Now, uh, Dinka clearly once had a similar system of number suffixes, which triggered assimilatory processes in the root that are still also attested with overt suffixes in other nilotic systems. Um, these suffixes were subsequently lost, triggering compens compensatory lengthening of the root. Uh, and this is kind of what results in, um, in the complexity of this system. 
Um, so we see a lot of changes in the root that sort of are non-transparently perhaps linked to uh, underlying affixes. Um, but uh, we can see that, uh, you know, if we look at uh, this uh, Dinka nouns, we can identify some of these nouns that clearly uh, once uh, belonged in, that, that uh, once had these kinds of overt suffixes. So there are nouns that are, that undergo lengthening in the plural that are, are likely, um, uh, that are inherently singular and likely had a suffix that was lost. There are nouns that are inherent that show lengthening in the singular and likely had a singular suffix that was lost. Uh, and there are nouns that show evidence of uh, some sort of uh, compensatory process on both sides. So um, uh, this uh, noun for a kind of gourd has vowel lowering in the singular, uh, which is a mark of uh, an assimilatory process triggered by a suffix, and it has lengthening in the plural to a long vowel, uh, which are, we are going to treat as, as numberless. Um, now, within uh, sort of an autosegmental approach to phonology, we can identify these processes of assimilation and lengthening with floating affixes. So although these affixes aren't um, overtly there anymore, we can maintain a concatenative approach by assuming that these affixes are, uh, in some sense, uh, floating, futurally deficient affixes that end up integrated into the root. So we're going to adopt this idea and propose that Dinka has a synchronic tripartite number system still, uh, just expressed through floating affixes. Um, that trigger these uh, 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 assimilatory processes as well as lengthening. Uh, now, uh, I cut. I, I didn't have. I don't have time. I think to go into Anderson's arguments against a psychronic tripartite analysis, but uh, I've included an appendix where I go through the where we go through them in detail and show that they are not uh, actually a problem uh, by uh, comparing his arguments to a um, the situation in Kipsigus, which is a, a, a language another nilotic language that retains um, tripartite number suffixes uh, for which all of Anderson's arguments also hold. So. Um, the, if you're interested in that question, we can go into it in the question period, or you can have a look at that uh, appendix. Um, okay, so the second ingredient we need to understand, I'm otherwise not going to talk in a lot of detail about uh, the semantics of uh, uh, the syntax, the morphosyntax of tripartite number. Um, so the second thing we need to understand is, uh, and this is also part of the complexity of um, Dinka morphology in general is the vowel raising and lowering that occurs in Dinka vowel grades. So what are these assimilatory processes that occur in uh, Dinka roots? Um, and so these terms are usually described following Torben Anderson's work in terms of three distinct vowel grades, uh, which, were, which uh, help us describe the processes of vowel lowering and raising that occur. So each morphological category uh, falls in, can be categorized either grade one, grade two, or grade three. Uh, and these grades are listed here in 17, um, where each row lists all the vowels that we find in a particular grade. Uh, so grade one has all these vowels at the top, and then uh, grade two has those, and grade three has those. And the columns indicate how the vowels correspond across grades. So E in grade one is E in grade two, but uh, yeah, in uh, grade three, for example. So how do, how do we, should we understand this? Well, uh, grade one is uh, usually considered basic, and assumed to, um, you know, this is assumed to reflect the underlying vowel in the root because it's most frequent and surfaces in uh, unmarked forms. It also is the one, uh, and it has the, it expresses the full range of contrasts between between vowels, whereas there is some, there's neutralization of a ah in grade three. There isn't neutralization in grade two in basic cases, but Anderson in a 2017 paper shows that there is also neutralization of, of grade uh, two in some derived uh, parts of the, in some parts of the verbal paradigm. Um, so grade one is kind of our, we can consider it to be the sort of basic vowel that's in a root. Um, grade two describes um, inflectional and derivational categories that trigger vowel raising. Uh, so you can see that grade two basically uh, doesn't change the vowel for the most part, but it raises underlying a ah to e. Eh. Uh, that's the only change both on the, in creaky and uh, in breathy uh, vowels, leaving all other vowels unaffected. So we see this pattern in a third person singular subject agreement, for instance, or a non-topical subject inflection. So you see this in 18, uh, where uh, these are the um, these two inflections both lengthen and change the tone, uh, and they also change the vowel into a grade two vowel. So a ah maps, maps to e, but the other vowels are, are unchanged. Um, grade three describes a different process, a process of vowel lowering uh, so you, and, and vowel breaking. You see that e, uh, for example, lowers to, to, to yeah, uh, for, for example, with breaking. Um, 
but uh, the, the low vol odd doesn't lower. So you get some neutralization here. So basically what you get is lowering in all cases, except for odd, which is unchanged. Um, all right, so you see that that's, that's the set of correspondences. And grade three actually changes the vowel um, almost always. It's also worth noting that because grade two uh, and grade, grade three doesn't affect a uh, and grade two only affects a, uh, there is no single, there's not really a pair of vowels that's ever ambiguous between whether lowering and raising has, has occurred. You can always tell if you compare two forms, uh, whether you're, what alternation you're, you're dealing with um, in, in the sort of basic cases. Okay, so um, grade three, uh, it's illustrated here in 19. So uh, first person singular is a grade three morpheme. Uh, so you get lowering and breaking except with ah. Uh, the second plural uh, subject clitic uh, uh, has a grade three effect on the, um, on the, on the root. So you get lowering uh, except for with ah. Uh, right, so you see this here in, in, in 19. Um, and um, as, I, as I mentioned, historically, these assimilatory processes reflect vowel suffixes that have since been lost. Um, and you can see this both when, when you compare uh, Dinka forms to uh, re uh, related languages. Uh, so you can see here are some examples where a, a grade, grade three corresponds to a, an a suffix and grade two corresponds to an s suffix in, in these examples, for, exa for, for instance. Um, and like I said, there are also nilotic languages that preserve these assimilatory processes with suffixes as well. Okay, so this is grade two and, and grade three, and, and these are important to understand. I, I keep, so this is, um, so I hope these processes of lowering and raising um, are, um, um, I've explained them sufficiently. A key point that I wanna emphasize here as well is that a vowel grade doesn't, it doesn't represent a single morpheme or a morphological uh, category, but is a way of describing the assimilatory processes that are used frequently in Dinka morphology. So they potentially re um, reflect a variety of different underlying vowel affixes that all just happen to have the uh, morphological effect of triggering the same assimilation process, right? So these are morphemes that just happen to have the same shape, at least what, when it comes to their uh, assimilatory effects. So um, yeah. So yeah, so it's not, but it's not like grade two or grade three are, are a single morpheme. Um, okay, so let's um, have a look at these vowel grades in number marking where they play uh, an important role. So um, I think everybody working on uh, this Dinka number mark marking has identified that uh, grade two and, and grade three are frequently used uh, to uh, uh, mark singulars and plurals. So we see here uh, Grade two uh, marking a singular, for instance. Remember that grade two is vowel raising. It raises a to e um, always. So you see that in the singular here, and you see that occurring in the plural as well. Um, note that identifying grade two is all, only going to be unambiguous when we have an a uh, a in the root, because otherwise um, the vowels are going to remain unchanged, and we don't necessarily know analytically whether this plural is actually grade one, which is what, it, what we can probably is, is most likely since that's the unmarked case, but it could also in principle be grade three because grade three also has this a vowel there. So that's sometimes a little bit tricky. Um, and we also see grade three in the singular and grade uh, three in the plural. Um, so uh, we see here vowel lowering in the singular, uh, uh, as, as uh, there's the signature of grade three, and here we see vowel lowering in, in the plural. Now, identifying grade three is a lot easier because most vowel lower, uh, most vowels lower except for ah, but again, there is some analytical ambiguity because the singulars in principle could be either grade one or grade two. So it's, uh, we have to be careful about that. Um, right, and as in the verbal domain, uh, uh, Anderson has shown that there are uh, other nilotic languages that preserve vowel suffixes that correspond exactly to these cases where uh, you seem to get these grade changes. So here for uh, uh, a bunch of different nouns, uh, you can see uh, the uh, cognates uh, that have overt uh, suffixes corresponding to these grade three and grade two uh, changes. Uh, and sometimes, yeah, right. And you can actually see here, uh, no, let me, that's right, um, okay. So our proposal, these vowel grade effects reflect uh, floating vowel suffixes, which are integrated into the root uh, as a result of the templatic requirements on Dinka nouns and which trigger assimilation uh, of, of some sort, right? They trigger either vowel raising or vowel lowering. So we might imagine that grade three is sort of floating low feature or something along those lines, whereas grade two likely is a sort of floating front feature associated with an uh, underspecified vowel. Uh, so in this view, the forms that we've just seen represent four different uh, number suffixes, four different floating suffixes. 
two of which trigger the grade two raising processes, one in the singular and one in the plural, but these are fundamentally still different affixes. Um, and two, that uh, just they, they just happen to have the same form, and two that trigger the grade three lowering, right? Um, and uh, you know, this the, the, I think this, this this view very much converges with this uh, Ladd and Bloom paper that I that I mentioned, who uh, posit these four nominal declensions as well. Okay, so with this in place, uh, we want to start by asking the question of how regular the form of these grade two and grade three suffixes actually is. Uh, and we're going to argue that a grade two and grade three suffixes have a regular representation and a regular effect on length and tone. And we're going to start with grade three suffixes because they're the easiest to identify. Uh, so we focus on 115 noun pairs that unambiguously involve grade three. So these are forms that all exhibit lowering. Um, it's going to be unambiguously identified. And the first uh, observation we want to make about this, I think, uh, I'll, I'll work on, uh, Dinka has recognized that um, grade two and grade three tend to have a lengthening effect. Um, but uh, it, I think we think we can say, we think uh, a slight, we actually see a slightly different pattern. A grade three suffix is lengthened, but they only lengthen to a medium vowel. In both the singular and the plural, uh, the majority of grade three nouns contain a medium vowel. So this is 90 out of 115 nouns. And so we're gonna posit that grade three suffixes uh, lengthen the root by uh, one uh, one mora. They contribute one mora. So we see this for uh, roots with a short vowel. There are 41 uh, nouns that uh, lengthen, uh, that trigger grade three and lengthen by one mora. So you see this in 28 for the plural and 29 for the singular. So these forms go from a short to a medium vowel and they trigger lowering. Uh, but with roots that contain a medium vowel, there's no apparent lengthening. So you see this in 30 and in 31, you get these mid vowel roots and you get a, a lower, you get lowering in the singular here and here in the plural, uh, but you get no um, change in length. Uh, finally, there are uh, 13 uh, long uh, grade three nouns that end in R, which uh, seem to suggest that grade three might actually also uh, have, uh, be capable of having these uh, long vowels. So you see this, so for example, in uh, blood feud, the lowered vowel is long, uh, but Romeisen and Gilly actually show that there's no distinction between medium and long vowels phonetically before R. So we can take all these uh, nouns to involve medium vowels underlyingly as well. And if that's true, then actually the really the vast majority of these nouns are bimoraic. So uh, 103 out of 115. So we're actually gonna propose that these, these grade three suffixes, both the singular one and the plural one are associated with a fixed um, bimoraic template, a fixed mid-vowel template. Um, we can think of this as a sort of affix-specific ban on long vowels or something like that. Um, should, the, should have this typo here. Uh, and this is actually not so strange for Dinka because uh, Anderson has noted the same behavior for the benefactive in the verbal domain. Uh, and there's two different papers actually, which we can discuss in the question period if anybody's interested in this, that uh, pre present different implementations of this kind of template within a uh, concatenative model. So, um, right, so in terms of length, a grade three has a, a specific uh, effect. In addition, we think grade three suffixes are regular when it comes to tone, uh, just in a more, slightly more complex way. So first of all, uh, many grade three nouns, uh, this, this is clearly the majority pattern in the unambiguous grade three nouns, carry a low tone. So in most cases, uh, like in uh, 33 here, uh, you get lowering as well as overriding of whatever lexical tone you have with a low tone. Uh, so you see this in the plural here, as well as in the, in the singular here. Uh, and this happens in the sort of majority of these forms. So we propose that this is just the tone that comes with the suffixes, both the singular and the plural suffixes come with a low tone, and these tones are gonna overwrite the stem tone. Um, but this is, not the, this is not the only pattern that you get. Uh, the remaining grade three nouns mostly carry a complex tone. And we have to say a little bit more about that because we think there's an intriguing uh, pattern of uh, mapping from the lexical tone to the, to the um, derived tone here. There are eight nouns that carry a high tone, but we're gonna treat these as exceptional. Uh, the, we're gonna treat these as exceptions. The other nouns all obey uh, a very interesting alternation pattern that's in 35. Um, so they have complex tones, right? So grade three nouns that have a rising tone will have either a rising tone, so they'll either preserve a rising tone from the root, or they'll have a high tone. Uh, this is true in 14 out of 17 cases. Grade three nouns with a falling tone have either a falling tone in the root that they preserve or a low tone. 
And so there's this sort of predictable alternation, which we propose can actually be derived. Uh, we suggest that the choice between this pattern in 35, this alternation pattern, as well as overriding with a low tone, reflects an underlying difference in Dinka roots in terms of uh, how faithful um, uh, they are to their lexical tone. Uh, so there's a, um, we're drawing some inspiration here from a dissertation by Siri uh, uh, Yasha on um, plurality in closely related nuer, in which he posits a distinction between uh, stable stems, uh, tone, uh, stems that tend to preserve their lexical tone and unstable stems who's al who allow their lexical tones to be overwritten. And that's effectively what we're gonna propose is happening here. Uh, these, uh, these stems in 33 and 34 are unstable. They allow their tones to be uh, overwritten. These stems in 35 allow um, their uh, lexical tone to be preserved. So this is straightforward in the cases of preserving a rising tone or preserving a falling tone. Um, but what's happening uh, in terms of the, of the simplex tones here? So we propose that this distinction actually manifests slightly differently. In particular, we propose the Dinka stable stems uh, map the combination of a lexical tone and their uh, and the suffix tone to form a complex tone. So they effectively combine their lexical tone with the suffix tone uh, to, so that you have a, a complex contour tone um, with low mapping to falling and high mapping to rising. Uh, now note that this is, so, uh, uh, so this is sketched in 36, a low toned root combining with a low toned uh, a grade three suffix will map onto a falling tone, uh, whereas a high toned root combined with a low toned suffix will map onto a rising tone. Note that it's actually an, uh, sort of counterintuitive from a phonological perspective, uh, because you're combining uh, in 37, a high tone and a low tone to form an LH instead of an HL. Uh, but we think this is this perhaps motivated from a phonetic perspective, uh, because uh, Remeisen and Ladd show that uh, uh, rising and high are uh, phonetically more similar and falling and low are, are phonetically similar as well. So effectively, you're mapping a lexical tone to its most similar complex tone. Um, that's at least the intuition we think may, might lie behind this, but I'm happy to discuss this in, in more detail. So grade three suffixes have a consistent representation. They're actually regular. They're low-toned vowel suffixes with a ban on long vowels. And these generalizations extend to a bunch of uh, ambiguous nouns, so nouns with ah. So remember that with nouns with ah don't show vowel lowering, uh, but we can now classify these as uh, being uh, having grade three suffixes as well because they have the same um, lengthening and tonal properties. And we'll see that there uh, actually no other declension class uh, has that effect in our in our story. Okay, so let's move on to uh, grade two suffixes. And again, we'll examine. Uh, we'll start by examining. Um, unambiguous uh, nouns that have grade two in the singular or the plurals. So this is a smaller set because it only, if only uh, you can only extract pairs alternating a with a. Uh, and we'll see that this uh, these suffixes actually be, have a very similar behavior, but there's an interesting uh, difference uh, that provides evidence, we think additional evidence for our a distinction between unstable and stable stems. So we're gonna propose, uh, but the, the effects on length and tone are very similar and we'll propose that they have the same representation. They're low toned and they, they, they contribute one more. Um, so uh, grade two suffixes are lengthening as also um, uh, argued by, by Ladd and Blum. So um, we can see that short vowels always lengthen to medium. There are no short grade two vowels uh, in this set. Uh, the pattern with medium vowels we're going to discuss in a little bit more detail, but you see uh, lengthening from short vowel to medium vowel, both in the singular uh, in these first two and then in the plural. Um, grade two suffixes also show the same tonal pattern. They, uh, 14 uh, nouns carry a uh, low tone. Only two grade two nouns in this uh, corpus carry a high tone, which we're going to, or unambiguous grade two nouns, which we again ex uh, suggest is exceptional. And the remaining nouns show exactly the same tonal mapping. So uh, this is in 41. So uh, nouns with a rising tone have a rising or high tone in the root. Nouns with a falling tone have a falling or low tone in the root. Uh, so this is really just the same pattern that we've already seen with grade three suffixes, where there are, there's a, there's a, presumably this is a low toned suffix that is either overriding the stem tone or with stable stems resulting in this complex tone that preserves the sort of essential quality of the lexical tone. Um, but there's an interesting difference that arises in the in the plural. So in the singular, this is basically the story. Uh, there's an interesting. There's a difference here between the singular and the plural, actually, which we think uh, provides some additional evidence that these are really different affixes. 
Um, but in grade two plurals, there's an important split that emerges with medium vowel. So remember that I didn't go into uh, the medium vowel data. So with grade three suffixes, we saw that medium vowels are not lengthened. They remain medium vowels. And there are a lot of grade two plur, there are a, a share of a fair number of unambiguous grade two plurals that do the same, right? So these are all uh, forms that are, have a medium vowel in the singular and a medium vowel in the plural. But there are also some uh, forms that become long. So there are some, these are all uh, cases of a medium uh, vowel in the singular where you lengthen to a long vowel in the plural, right? Which is a pattern that we didn't see in the grade three suffixes. Um, but what we wanna point out is that there is a striking difference between these two sets. Um, if we look on the, uh, on the right in the uh, forms that uh, lengthen to long, they all have a low tone. They all overwrite their lexical tone with a low tone. So these are all unstable stems, um, right, in, in, our, in our story. They're stems that allow their lexical tone to be overwritten. Um, but if we look at the grade two plurals that don't lengthen uh, a medium vowel, these are all, uh, in fact, stable stems. These all show this mapping from a, say, low tone to a falling tone, low tone to falling, high to rising, uh, uh, and uh, rising to rising again. So these are all stable stems. Uh, so we want to suggest that this is actually an, a pattern of allomorphy that's sensitive to the stem difference that we've posited. Um, what we also see is that uh, there's an additional effect in the, uh, in the grade two uh, stable stem plurals. These all acquire breathy voice. Uh, and you see that in the first uh, six forms here, they all become breathy voiced in the plural. Whereas the, the forms in the, uh, uh, that lengthen to long, they don't acquire uh, a breathy voice, uh, although there's only really two relevant examples here. Um, so we want to propose that this grade two suffix, in fact, has two allomorphs, which are sensitive to this distinction between stable and unstable stems that we've posited, which also makes um, this a pattern of changing from creaky to breathy voice, which is uh, found in sort of only a subset of these, of these nouns, uh, predictable. It, it actually correlates with um, uh, independent changes in tone and length. So with stable stems, the grade two plural is associated with a ban on long vowels as, uh, and, and also it has breathy voice. Um, so it will not, uh, it will lengthen a short stem but not a medium one. And in fact, you can see there are also short stems, uh, short roots that lengthen to medium but it, uh, that are, when they're stable, they, they acquire breathy voice. Uh, but, but with unstable stem, the grade two plural just lengthens by one more, short to medium and medium to long. So grade two suffixes then also have a consistent representation as low tone vowel suffixes that contribute one mora with allomorphy based on stem type, uh, providing further support for the idea that, that that's behind the sort of tonal patterns that we see. And these generalizations extend to a fair number of noun pairs. Recall that grade two uh, doesn't actually change most vowels. The uh, vowel raising only affects uh, a. Um, so there are a fair number of cases where we don't actually see a change in the vowel, but we can still treat these as grade, as involving grade two because they involve the same alternations in voice and tone. So ankle, for instance, has a, a high tone in the plural, but a low tone in the singular. So we can uh, treat this as a grade two singular um, with uh, high tone um, with a low tone uh, over overwriting. Recall that the singular grade two has a, uh, does have always have a bi bimoraic restriction. Uh, it's, so here it's maybe a little bit subtle, but there are other forms where it's really clear that you are dealing with grade two. So if you look at the uh, three forms here, hat, kind of fish, and uh, gourd to use, uh, used to hold water, you see that there's no vowel change, but these forms all show the mapping to a complex tone and the, uh, acquisition of breathy voice, as well as the mapping from a medium to a medium. Uh, so the lack of lengthening to long. Uh, so these are showing that same stable stem um, uh, grade two pattern. Okay, so those are the grade two, grade three suffixes. And by now you've probably come to appreciate why Dinka is such a hard uh, a problem. You're probably, if you are, are new to Dinka, you're probably, uh, probably um, made you dizzy uh, with, uh, 
the amount of stuff that's going on. Um, but we have two more uh, inflection classes to cover and they're, they're, they're important. So we're gonna argue that we can also identify a default strategy for number marking. Dinka, a, a number morphology is a regular system with a default strategy. And the final declensions that we'll discuss don't involve any changes in the vowels, so we're, uh, but they just lengthen the singular and the plural to long without any change in the vowel. And this effect occurs both in the singular again and in the plural. And in addition, we're gonna show that what we're gonna call the long plural, the plural that lengthens to long, is the default numbers, default strategy for number marking, productively applying to long words as well as nominalizations. And this is, I think, the main point, as I understand it, uh, where we diverge from uh, Ladd and Blum's proposal, uh, who treat all the forms with uh, no raising or lowering as part of a grade two alternation or part of a grade three alternation. Um, so we're going to end up positing two additional inflection classes, which allows us to identify this uh, default strategy. Um, and also uh, makes, I think, the also changes the generalizations about grade two and grade three such that they can be stated in the way that, that, that we did. Uh, but I'm happy to discuss that more in the uh, question period. And I hope I've characterized that correctly. Um, okay, so uh, the long plural. So uh, the long plural uh, takes a, uh, any kind of singular root, whether it's short or medium, uh, and lengthens it to long. So we see this in, in 47. There are 58 noun pairs. So this is a default strategy, but it's not, and it's actually relatively infrequent over the whole corpus, right? It's not, a, uh, it's not the majority pattern at all. And as you can see, there's no evidence of any of the assimilatory processes associated with grade two or grade three. The vowel doesn't change. Um, 37 of these nouns surface with a low tone. They overwrite the stem tone with a low tone. The remaining 21 all carry a complex tone in a pattern that's probably familiar at this point where a low tone uh, maps to a falling tone. Uh, so in, in 20 out of 21 cases, there is a, a low tone here. Um, there don't seem to be cases mapping high to rising. Um, I'm not quite sure why. It could be that the high tone is sort of a cue to being an unstable stem in this class, um, but uh, those don't, you, you always seem to get a correspondence between low and falling here. So we get the same tonal interaction as before. So we're gonna posit a low toned uh, bimeraic plural suffix that will attach to a, a root and lengthen a vowel to long, contributing two moras, and uh, which will uh, display the same tonal interactions with stable stems that's previously described. So when it attaches to a stable stem, you'll get a complex tone. And this plural suffix is very regular. It's regular in, in 57 out of 58 noun pairs. Now, what's also nice about recognizing this inflection class is that uh, as has been noted in previous work uh, uh, on the irregularity of Dinka, when we look at loan words, um, there is evidence that, there, that a long low tone plural is the default strategy for number marking. Uh, so uh, there are 10 loan words in the Langjuang corpus uh, and nine of them make use of this plural strategy. Uh, so they're, they're all given here and you see the a variety of loan words, they all lengthen the final syllable, it gets treated as the one in which you express all these inflectional uh, changes and they all lengthen to a long vowel um, with a, a low tone that overrides the, the stem tone. Uh, there's, one, uh, there's one exception to this, uh, which uh, ends up looking like a numberless noun in our, in our system. And uh, Anderson makes the same observation for the loan words that he collects, uh, has collected for, for the Agar dialect. Uh, in addition, he notes that this strategy is also used to form plurals of uh, some nominalized verbs in Agar as well. So we see some examples here of nominalizations where we also see, where we see verbs uh, that uh, form, uh, that uh, have a, a, a nominalizing prefix and uh, form their plural with a low toned long plural. So this long plural we propose is the default strategy for number marking and is regular in the right context. And this, these facts should suggest a view of Dinka as not necessarily that different from a gender language with a, a couple of declension classes, but it's a tripartite language in which each number class has a few inflection classes. Uh, so for example, for the inherently singular nouns, we can posit three inflection classes, which are given here in table two. Um, inflection class one, which has the long plural, inflection class two, which has the grade two plural, and inflection class three, which has the grade two, three plural. And I've given you numbers here for the sort of proportion, the number of nouns and the proportion of them that, that fully obey the patterns that we've described here. And you can see that it's the majority in, in uh, all three cases. 
Um, there's also a class of uh, inherently plural nouns that form the singular with a long suffix. So you see this in 54, this is the long singular. Um, uh, so all of these um, nouns, the, regardless of whether they're short or medium underlyingly, will lengthen to long. And we saw previously that grade two and grade three are associated with a, a bimoraic template. So these are uh, not analytically ambiguous in the view that we propose, right? Um, this class of nouns is actually not consistently associated with any particular tone. It diverges tonally from the other uh, uh, affixes. The singular form surfaces with all four tones, um, and it's distinct from the underlying tone in all but one pair. So it's not really clear um, uh, that you have one particular tone. Um, more precisely, uh, there are we identify four sort of predominant patterns of tonal alternations in this class. Um, this is reminiscent of the sort of tonal alternations that. Uh, um, uh, Ladd and Blum also, also note, um, but we think these, these four mainly occur in this class. Uh, a low alternating with high, falling alternating with rising or high, rising alternating with falling or low, as well as high alternating with rising. Um, so we're gonna tentatively suggest uh, that this pattern is, uh, reflects a tonal polarity effect, uh, since uh, this is at the heart of low, uh, the low, high, falling, rising, rising, falling alternations uh, that we see in the first three, three patterns. So we're gonna posit a uh, bimoraic uh, singular suffix that lengthens all roots to long and carries a dissimilatory tone, which overwrites the root tone. Uh, and for reasons of time, I won't go into this uh, high rise, rising pattern or the uh, low and high alternates here, um, but uh, we can, you can see some comments on this in the, in the footnotes and we can go over this in the, in the question period in more, in more detail um, for some thoughts on what might be going on there. Um, but this is the long singular class. Um, so, and again, so in this view of inherently plural nouns, we end up with three inflection classes here as well, which are given in, in table three, which we've named four, five, and six, um, four for the, the long singular class. Uh, then there's this grade two singular class and this grade uh, uh, three singular class as well. And you can see the rough proportion of regular nouns uh, here uh, as well. Uh, and as you can see, it's the majority pattern. The majority of the nouns fit the patterns that we've described. So the resulting picture here is that Dinka is a tripartite language with a few inflection classes per number class. What's unusual only is that all these affixes are, are floating vowel affixes integrating into, integrating into the root. Uh, but uh, aside from that, this is no uh, different from a gender system with a few uh, declension classes. There's a, a regular strategy for, for plural, uh, for, for number marking. We're not gonna go over the third class of nouns in detail, uh, numberless nouns, because this, uh, just for reasons of time, uh, these are nouns that, that we propose have an affix in the singular in the, in the plural, but appendix B identifies a set of uh, 28 nouns that fall in this, in this class. And I'm happy to go over that appendix in the, in the question period. Now these rules account for the majority of this corpus, 93% of this corpus. Uh, the remaining 25 irregular nouns uh, show a variety of patterns including suppletion, for instance, or unexpected changes in the vowel or coda alternations. Uh, but we think that th uh, these are detailed in, in another appendix. We think that these uh, don't uh, really pose that much of a challenge for this view. And in fact, if we look at the irregular forms, more than half of them show the long, low-toned plural, um, um, you know, setting aside differences that occur in, this, in, in suppletion and so on. Uh, so the vowels and the uh, uh, consonants might be totally different, but you get a long vowel and a, and a low-toned plural. And so we think that provides additional support for the idea that the long low tone plural is the default strategy. Um, okay. All right, so before concluding, I wanna briefly talk about assessing the claim that this is a regular system. Um, so there are probably a variety of ways of, of doing this. Um, but uh, we wanted to uh, we wanted to show uh, we wanted to try out one of them that we that we know about that we've uh, seen used for th for this before. So we're going to we claim that this is a rule governed in regular system, um, and we're going to assess the regularity of Dinka morphology using uh, Yang's tolerance principle. Uh, so uh, Charles Yang has this uh, book on uh, linguistic productivity where he proposes that the productivity of a rule can be evaluated with a formula in 60, which um, uh, gives you a number of exceptions for a set of lexical items uh, that a, a rule should ideally, uh, ideally meet. Uh, so it's n uh, divided by the, the natural log of n. Um, and uh, how does this, so this, you know, uh, this rule um, characterizes how many exceptions uh, a rule uh, should, should have for a whole class, a whole category. Um, 
So how does this apply to flexional classes? Because obviously there is no rule that meets this definition within uh, the whole class of nouns in Dinka, uh, because all these number marking strategies are only attested in some uh, subpart of the, of the nouns. So um, argue, Yang argues that given sufficient evidence, learners will create subdivisions in lexical categories when there's no general productive rule. And this, the, tolerable, the tolerance principle will then apply within these declension classes. So he uses this to, uh, he applies this to the gender system of German, but we think you can similarly apply it to this tripartite uh, system. Um, so we've just, uh, to give you a sense of, um, what this looks like, we've uh, there's a table here that uh, assesses all of our six inflection classes using the tolerance principle. So you can see the uh, number of regular nouns and the uh, predicted number of permitted exceptions for this rule, these rules to be uh, regular. And you can see that all of these six classes meet this definition of, of regularity. Um, uh, in all cases, these these are applying to sort of 75 75% percent, uh, percent, percent of the nouns at least. Um, We've counted numberless nouns here as belonging both to a singular and plural inflection class with exceptions counted double where we are not sure where the irregularity lies. And this is in fact the conservative move because the tolerance principle, because of the way this formula is stated, uh, allows more exceptions uh, for relatively speaking for smaller numbers. So the bigger the numbers here, the better, but nothing actually fundamentally hinges on this choice anyway. Okay, so we, we think that this is a, a regular system. Think of plural morphology is regular and concatenative. It's complex, but it doesn't really require positing a fully irregular inflectional system. Uh, and the large variety of phonological changes can be accounted for with a, a relatively limited set of floating vowel affixes. So to wrap up, what we've shown is that although uh, Dinka morphology has been cited as a challenge to item-based approaches to morphology, it makes use of fully concatenative processes. Uh, and um, uh, we, have, we're, we haven't touched on the verbal domain here, but Jochen Trommer has a bunch of work on, on this that reaches similar conclusions. Um, and in addition, when we recognize the importance of both tripartite number as well as inflection classes, we can see that uh, Dinka nominal morphology is regular. So in this view, we don't think that Dinka number morphology, although perhaps less um, uh, familiar at first glance, is necessarily more complex than plural marking in a, in a language like German, uh, a well-studied uh, system with a lot of um, irregular, with a lot of apparent uh, allomorphy. Uh, and in German too, the productive number marking strategy with loan words is not a pattern that obtains with the majority of, of nouns. Uh, in addition, we note that although the, the system we've posited might, uh, the root internal morph uh, alternations are complex, the learner is aided by a number of, of factors. Uh, one, you know, the patterns are easier to determine in the unambiguous nouns, uh, which we've demonstrated. Uh, also, pho um, phonological markedness is a, is a reliable cue. Vowel raising and lowering and lengthening always si signal the presence of an underlying affix. The inventory of floating affixes is small because many of the uh, same processes are reused. And many of the processes that we've talked about, like lengthening, tonal, tonal overriding, uh, acquisition of breathy voice, as well as grade two and grade three are used very regularly in the uh, verbal morphology as well. So they're gonna be, from, uh, they're gonna be strengthened. Um, the learner is gonna um, be from more familiar with them because of that. And like gender, tripartite number has a semantic basis that provides a sort of useful, if imperfect guide to the system as well. Uh, Appendix D goes over a bunch more uh, cues and generalizations, also some about uh, the particular inflection classes that we've tried to tentatively identify. So the take home message then is that there may not be any morphological systems that are fully irregular. Uh, Western nilotic systems may not need to pose a, such a challenge to a concatenative view of, of morphology. And we think this nicely converges with some uh, other very recent work, both on Dinka and Nuer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kopi, for, for presenting this very interesting research. Now we will start the discussion session with invited discussant Matthew Bierman, Principal Research Fellow at the University of Surrey. Thanks, Dr. Bierman, for accepting our invitation. Oh, thank you for inviting me. And um, thank you to Kopa for a really interesting and insightful talk. Uh, and also thank you for um, letting me have um, the handout ahead of time so I could um, get a head start on, on looking at it because it's um, complex material. Um, I think you've done a really good job at, um, at 
elucidating uh, some plausible principles behind um, uh, uh, behind this otherwise opaque seeming system. Uh, and I've got um, as somebody who works on a, a, a related Western nilotic language, all sorts of um, uh, data questions, which um, I will um, suppress in the interest of um, uh, stuff, which is maybe of more general interest to, interest to the audience, um, some of the audience. Uh, so the first question I had was um, that uh, on the notion of, well, you talk about regularity and, and um, concatenation. So the, I first wanted, I wasn't quite sure that I really understood what you mean by regularity. Um, and let me say what I mean. Um, so that given any form, be it a singular form or a plural form, although you've effectively shown that you can reduce the, um, the call them affixes, call them morphophonological processes to a very limited inventory, even so, given any, any one form, you've got at least two choices. I mean, I haven't actually calculated this, but I, my impression is you have at least two choices. If you've got a singular form, at least two choices what your plural form can be and vice versa. And that's not even factoring in the um, so-called numberless nouns, which are the third part of the tripartite number system. The effect of which is that for, um, even though the the the, the, morph the inventory of, of um, morphemes is very small, uh, in order to know in concrete terms to know the paradigm of a Dinka noun, you have to know the paradigm of a Dinka noun. So is that regular? Or is that irregular? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Um, and I think that uh, I mean I think there are, there are, there are two two things that that I want to say here. I mean I think one. Um, difference between, um, so if we think about say a gender marking language like German, which is the analogy that I was kind of trying to draw, um, as you as you I think are kind of pointing out that there, there are other cues in that system that tell you the gender of the, of the noun. Uh, and so maybe those help you if you encounter the singular form to predict the plural form. Whereas for, for Dink, it seems like you need to know the pairs. Um, well, I mean, one question that I have here that I can't answer because I don't have the I don't have the data on it. There are other nominal parts of this nominal paradigm, like the construct state and the construct states um, and the uh, uh, case marking, uh, that might also uh, that you know one would hope uh, tracks these declension classes that might also give you some outside uh, information for uh, what uh, kind of root you're dealing with. Um, and um, in, in addition to the sort of semantics that also guides you. Uh, in terms of the notion of regularity, I think you're, you're right in that um, when, when we say regularity here, we can't really mean predictability um, in this, in maybe not in the, in the strongest sense. Um, and, and clearly this is also sort of behind maybe uh, one of the things that's kind of cited that's sometimes uh, informally described in, in these papers is that uh, nonce word tests are difficult and that there's maybe a, 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 a variation. So I, I guess one thing that we mean here is that this is uh, rule governed. Uh, maybe there, it's important to make a distinction between predictability and whether something is rule governed. And what I'm thinking of here is that, uh, so Ch Charles Yang, uh, whose work we're definitely influenced by has this um, discussion uh, he derives the tolerance principle from uh, computational assumptions about when it is efficient to store something as a rule rather than fully learn uh, all the exceptions. Because there are, you know, if a rule has too many exceptions, it's just going to be more efficient to learn uh, a list. Um, so, and, and so that's by that definition, clearly the Dinka system uh, meets the, the criterion of you want to store these as rules. Um, that uh, that derive the, the relevant forms rather than just learning all the forms uh, in a listed way. Um, so I think maybe, but maybe that's not always necessarily the same as rule governed in particularly in this kind of potentially closed paradigm where you're dealing with, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, just singular and plural pairs um, and you need to know these, these inflection classes. So um, maybe when we, uh, maybe it's useful to distinguish two levels of kind of regularity. There's whether something is rule governed and it's efficient to learn um, 
to learn a system as rules and whether there's predictability. And I think we definitely wanna claim that it's rule governed, but whether it's fully predictable, uh, I don't think we can claim that yet, but maybe if we knew more about other parts of the, the nominal paradigm, maybe um, that could help you out. I do think there are some semantic cues to the tripartite number system that also, also help you. Yeah, I mean that might be that might be an important part of it because I'm thinking. I mean, if, if you if you've got such a limited number of, I mean, say what you're doing is memorizing, you know, not the plural form but the plural formative, and you've only got two choices, you still have to, you know, you still have to remember that. And whether it's well, um, yeah. actually, it's interesting you brought up the 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 the, the singular the the case paradigm because I think that is going to be uh, an important clue to figuring out the nature of these rules because I am extrapolating from Nuer where um, it's a bit, well, it's a bit, bit clearer to me just because I know the data better. But as you know, from the verbal system of um, Dinka, uh, you've got one set of processes that's involved in the derivation of say, um, uh, valence alternating paradigms. So you go from modal to breathy for that. And then within any one of those paradigms, you have inflection for subject person and other stuff. And that involves these vowel um, height operations. Uh, and what we see in, I think we see that from what I, from the data from Anderson that I know, and also from Noir, is we see that um, the singular plural alternations involve all of those processes, both the verbal derivational and the verbal inflectional processes, but the case inflection within any one number is restricted to those inflectional type processes. So there's a qualitative difference in the flavor of the inflectional thing. So that will then, I think if you, if you would get data on that, that will help you kind of tease apart what's going on in um, that. Um, second question, um, so you, you've got regularity concatenation. Um, you've got a few processes which the output of which is fixed regardless of what the input is. And given, you know, so given a system where you've got, you know, any basic root will be long or mid length, and then you can add some degree of length to that, you, you know, you would, your the default expectation on a concatenative view of it is that you would shift one degree further. And that is actually kind of what goes on for the most part in Nuer. Um, but the fact that you've got these, you know, one, two, pro, two apparently independent processes um, involving grade two and grade three, alter, no, it's, yeah, it's grade three and grade two alternations that, who's, that yield a, um, a, a mid-length output regardless of the input, and then another lengthening which yields a long um, uh, stem as the output. That seems kind of templatic rather than concatenative. So what, so you say that it's fully concatenative, but is it? Because yeah, the, no, the, the concatenation then has to evaluate the whole form in order to know whether it's doing it right. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly concatenative maybe with some, some topic stuff. I mean, we, I mean, we need to think a little bit about what, how we actually want to derive this more, more fully, but I guess the, the idea is that at least the representation of the morpheme can be consistent and doesn't have to be, you don't have to have a process morpheme, a morpheme that says you, you trigger some sort of process. Um, but we, so, we, so we're, what we're basically assuming is that affixes can sometimes be associated with specific phonological constraints, such as a ban on long vowels, uh, which is kind of like a, I mean, essentially that's a templatic effect, except maybe we think that it's natural to have bans on long vowels as a phonological constraint because some languages maintain that. Um, but yeah, maybe it is a concatenative view with some uh, templatic restrictions like that. Uh, we, we don't really necessarily want to take a view on how to derive templatic effects within a concatenative system, although there are a lot of proposals. One of the things that we referenced is this Tromer paper who has a view of how uh, a concatenative morphology can deliver a sort of bimoraic template, although we 
I mean, he has essentially ends up uh, um, treating these forms as circumfixes, moraic circumfixes that have the delete everything in the middle and sort of come together, um, which is a nice proposal, but I don't think we really see any evidence uh, historically or uh, in related languages that these forms have, have uh, circumfixes. Um, so yeah, certainly we need to acknowledge that we need to have at least this, uh, this uh, possibility of introducing with an affix a phonological constraint, so affix specific phonology. Um, and whether that means we ultimately need to have a template as well, um, that, 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 might, that, might be, that might be true. One of the um, uh, pieces that we cited certainly embraces that. I mean, in addition to that, um, I think as, you, as, as Nuer also shows us, there are definitely forms that take a, um, a so in, in Dinka, you're always lengthening, at least in the nominal domain, but there are definitely uh, processes that shorten. Uh, and for those, you know, we probably need to say that you can uh, have a sort of a goal template that you aim for um, uh, to begin with. So um, yeah, I, I think, I, I think you, you do need to have at least some role for templates in the system still. So in that sense, it's maybe not fully traditionally, it's not fully traditionally concatenative. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't see a problem with that because um, the important thing is that you have a, you know, restricted range of operations that you can perform and whether you represent that as, as a, a, whether you derive that by concatenation or by some other means seems less crucial to the analysis. But um, can I ask a really, I mean, I was, I, I should have access to um, the, um, questions that are coming in from the audience, but I haven't, um, I'm not seeing that yet, but I'm gonna ask my, I'm gonna ask a really nerdy question um, or raise a really nerdy point. Um, on example 42. Should I I'll pull that up? Um, you, um, you derive this alternation between these two patterns. I mean, it's, it's, um, triggered by the tonal class and then you get these two different, um, uh, uh, allomorphs. Uh, I just wanted to point out in the case of what's going on in 42, the fact that you've got this breathy voice being introduced, um, suggests like a really, there's a really profound difference between that morpheme and the one that's represented in, in um, 43. Um, in particular, because that is the, the modal breathy alternation is the one that we see in the verbal system associated with a, um, uh, a derivational alternation, one which historically We'll go back to some kind of, um, you know, uh, plus ATR suffix. Um, so this is really, it, it, I guess it's really surprising to me to see tonal class induce such a um, drastic um, uh, allomorphy there whose, whose um, historical roots go back, you know, millennia if not what centuries i don't know who knows but um, a long time yeah that's that's a great that's a great point i mean i mean maybe one of maybe what could be going maybe that just tells us that the stable stems at least in some cases have uh, uh, an additional affix in their history um but I, I don't i mean i don't know what that would be but that could be um what uh that could, that could fit with what you're, you're saying. One of the intuitions I sort of had about this, which might be just not at all uh, sort of historically um, responsible was that in a sense, um, if we think of um, uh, ATR as phonetically kind of raising the vowel, um, what you're sort of intuitively doing is in the absence of lengthening, you could sort of see this as a sort of compensatory uh, additional raising maybe because you're accentuating the vowel raising uh, in some intuitive sense. Um, 
but this doesn't really make sense of why you do also do it when you go from a short to a medium. Uh, but you know, there is an additional, there's a degree of length that's not manifesting here. And so you're experiencing, you're maybe expressing this contrast a little, you're, artic you're enhancing this contrast in the vowel raising in some. In I mean, some, some, of, some of these alternations like in crocodile and bullet, which is also fire, you mm -hmm. see in, um, in Burun languages. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's which have still have the overt they still have the overt number suffixes. And so this stem alternation is something which goes back like, it's super old. Um, anyway, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I don't have a, um, I don't have a um, coherent um, uh, analysis, but I think it's, it's, it's um, um, something to focus on. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing also is that in, in that com compensatory kind of story, you could think that grade two is always breathy. I mean, this is an association that Ladd and Blum also talk about. Grade two is, seems to be associated with breathy voice. And you can think that it's always breathy and that what's kind of happening is a difference in the extent to which these stems are expressing that or uh, allow that to overwrite their, their voicing. Um, in which case that, that might be also make more sense of the sort of um, cognate data. But anyway. Um, I'm, I've just opened up the um, uh, the chat, um, and I'm looking for questions. Um, some 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 of the some of the people in the chat are answering the questions that have been posed in the chat. So I'm trying to find the first question that hasn't been answered yet. Um, um, so Mirella Mirella Bloom asks. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. You mentioned agar data in one of the footnotes showing that it has the expected form regarding the tonal polarity effects, whereas Wanjung does not. But agar is a three-tone dialect. Dialects of Dinka can differ considerably in their tone systems and in vowel length on specific lexical items. Um, are you working on or considering generalizing this theory to Dinka across dialects? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. Um, certainly, uh, we haven't done the sort of level of, of sort of detailed work that um, that uh, Lad and and uh, Robert Lad and, and Morella have done on uh, the dialect comparison. Uh, we have ha compiled a, a kind of my, a small corpus of uh, of the Agar nouns based on some of the Anderson papers uh, as well to see if we can uh, to, to see if it's. Similar and uh, my, you know, initially it does it, it does seem like you can classify the nouns into the same inflection classes. Um, so you get this. You, you, I think we. I think you can confidently identify uh, the same um, effects. Although there are some uh, differences. So um, the tone there doesn't really seem to be a tonal polarity effect in the long singular. Um, so um, and so my point in that footnote was that the. Uh, prediction that there that some of the uh, unusual high toned forms have a, a, a falling tone in um, in one join, but they don't necessarily uh, participate in the same polarity effect. It's just the singular has that same form. So the long singular doesn't seem to show clear polarity. In addition, grade two, I think impressionistically is tonally distinct from grade three in that it has a high tone. Um, and uh, so that's some, some evidence that those tonal uh, effects go with the, uh, the grades. Um, uh, that there are different affixes. Um, and grade three in the singular seems to lengthen to long. Um, rather, it doesn't seem to have a um, medium vowel template, although it does have that in the plural. Um, so I, I, so we, I have looked at this, we have looked at this a little bit and uh, we do think that this theory uh, could has potential there. Uh, a big caveat is that um, now this corpus is sort of this kind of, this is only a small list of about 120 nouns that we got from some of the Anderson papers. Uh, so that's not the same size of corpus. And obviously the selection of these examples is kind of based on the examples that uh, he cited as being regular or particularly irregular. And so it might not be as representative. Um, but yeah, uh, we're not necessarily uh, working on this actively, but we do cautiously think that those, um, uh, that this kind of proposal could work for other dialects as well. Um, I see another comment from uh, Mirella, presumably uh, in response to the previous discussion on example 42, that Anderson 2017 notes that raising with change to breathy often follows a palatal or a semivowel. Yeah, that's, that's right here. You get this um, uh, 
a instead of the e eh, um, in the in the in these in these palatals here. Uh, but the full effect isn't necessarily about um, palatals. Um, yeah, and also, well, like I, I guess as I as I um, said, I mean, I've seen. I mean, I remember some of these uh, the cognate examples from from other languages, and so it's a, it's a, it's um, not just that. Nerasa, thank you. Um, when you said, I have another question, if that's okay. Um, when you said that the, um, uh, the, the, that your classes um, covered 93% of the nouns, does that include the, um, uh, the so-called numberless nouns? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have, yeah, I did include those in that, in that count, yeah. Um, and so there's 28 of those. So I guess that's um, less than 10%, but yeah. Because the numberless nouns are, a I mean, as in, I guess, all tripartite number systems or the ones that I've read about at least are a combination of singular and plural um, morphology and the generalizations about form do extend to them. So um, I can show you the numberless nouns. So there are three classes that we identified. There are, uh, there are all combinations of other inflection classes and the generalizations in principle extend. So there is a class that has a long plural, um, for example. So these are all long low toned plurals. Um, so they have the same form um, as the inflection class uh, uh, one plurals. Uh, and these are grade three singulars um, and they uh, seem to obey the same generalizations. With the numberless nouns, it's not always easy to tell whether they're necessary. You know, they're, they're, some of the tonal overriding can, can obscure the lexical tone. So sometimes there's some analytical ambiguity that allows you to, that means that um, it's, uh, if you don't know the lexical tone, you can say it's regular, but you don't actually know. Um, but yeah, we've count, so we've counted these as um, part of that because these inflection classes are, are showing up here. Um, and we also counted these as in the, when we were assessing regularity, we counted the exceptions in these forms as well. Um, but yeah, so these are, these are the classes of numberless nouns that you get. But yeah, but you can see they obey the pattern. So the grade three forms are all, are almost all bimoraic as well. Um, for example, they have the same template and they're, they're either low toned or they have a, a complex tone for the most part. Yeah, I, I might, um, I don't know, what percentage did you say they were of the um, total? We identified tw 28. Um, okay, um, I mean, my, uh, my impression, I mean, we, I mean our, our corpus on where is not, is not, you know, is not, not systematic in the sense that we want to do statistics off of it, but our impression is that that the equivalent type there is, is not infrequent. Oh, um, right. Partly, I think partly, you know, partly it's going to be things like um, uh, um, deverbal nouns of certain types will um, uh, typically have a, a particular, well, the, um, the, um, there's a kind of like verbal noun that we have called a gerund, um, which does all the things you'd kind of expect a verbal noun to do. And is typically typically has a, um, a complex, you know, derived singular form. Those normally don't have plurals, but they can be lexical. They can be lexicalized, and then they get a plural. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, I think one thing that's made, that's, that's that's still for me a little bit of an open question about our analysis is that we haven't really identified a distinguishing feature of the num numberless nouns in terms of a sort of generalization that would tell the learner, oh, this is. Is going to be something that you want to treat as a numberless noun. I mean, the variation it, it has been like for for nilotic systems with overt uh, tripartite number suffixes. There, it's been reported that there is variation in terms of the the the, the number that uh, that fall into those. So Kips, Kipsigus has a relatively small class of numberless nouns as well, for example. Um, but one is certainly for le learnability. You would hope that there is at least some sort of 
uh, read, readily-ish identifiable class of nouns out there that, that shows some of these that shows some of these patterns to kind of aid the learner in figuring out um, that these classes exist. Um, certainly, th these classes always they combine the number marking of the of the singular and the plural, so you kind of know that that those are out there. But we haven't really been able to identify a syntactic or sort of semantic property of the of the nouns that kind of tells you. Um, that you're uh, that you need to be in 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 the numberless noun class, but we're also not really aware of a kind of consistent semantic property that goes along with being numberless across tripartite number systems. Um, in the same way that there there seem to be generalizations for inherently singular and inherently plural. And no, uh, we've got another question in the chat. Um, Hector B says, um, I would like to know why you do not treat Dinka morphology. Um, it, it, like an Afroasiatic root and pattern um, system, instead of being linear concatenative system. Um, what would the? I, mean, I suppose I yeah I haven't thought about that. That's a, an interesting question. Now let me write that down as something to to think about in a little bit more detail. Um, off the cuff, I would say that we're, we're seeing here a system in which the vowel alternations involve kind of predictable deviations from the underlying vowel. So I think we wanna say that the form of the root includes the vowel, right? Like grade one is the basis of, um, and although grade one, grade two, grade three might seem like you could translate them into templates, you could think of them as templates, they're related to each other in form in a way that the sort of vowel melodies of root and like classic root and pattern systems aren't necessarily. Uh, so um, I think we want to think of grade one as really um, realizing the, uh, the telling you the basic uh, roots, the, the vowel that's in the root. And we want to think of uh, the, the root as the input to uh, the grade two, grade three manipulation. But it's certainly a good question because how exactly to implement the grade two, grade three assimilatory processes is not straightforward. Grade three is a complex kind of chain shift, um, which is not, uh, you know, there are a variety of proposals out there in the morphophonological literature about how to accomplish that kind of effect, but it's not always straightforward. For example, in classic optimality theory, it's not necessarily straightforward to generate a, a chain shift of, of that sort. But I think broadly speaking, the reason why we don't want to treat this as root and pattern is just because the um, the, the, vowel, uh, the vowels that you see are, are clearly predictable from the underlying uh, root vowel. So they're, they're not um, independent vowel melodies. I might, I might add to that, that in the, um, uh, the 1933 description of Nuer by um, uh, Kratzovara, he describes the Nuer equivalent of the um, grade one, grade three alternation as um, basic versus modified. So even in a, you know, pre, um, you know, Bloomfieldian um, paradigm, it was clear to him that like, you know, you had something was being done to these vowels. It's a bit clearer in Nuer also because the, um, most of them are diphthongs and they are, you know, you can, like the, the um, uh, uh, oh, we've got apologies in advance from Morella for a very long question coming. So um, uh, I don't know if we should um, uh, wait for that question or um, I was actually, while we're waiting for Morella's question, um, I was gonna actually, I don't know that anybody has an answer to this. Um, uh, again, point out a, um, a Nuer fact that is to say that um, all of the, equi the, the equivalent to the grade two in where it's just lengthening. Um, and I haven't, I mean, I haven't thought enough about Dinka and probably somebody else has thought enough about Dinka, maybe Marilla, um, that um, it, it looks like, and, and also you see like, Noir has more vowels. So, I mean, that may be that, that I think there's, I think it's a known fact that, that, that Dinka has um, kind of collapsed the vowel system a bit. So it kind of looks like this grade two 
is really a length, you know, it really is a lengthening process, which is somehow interacting with um, some kind of diachronic vowel merger processes. Like it's not really a, not, but I don't, this is very vague, um, uh, very vague um, formulation, but it is, that is to say, it's, it's more, it's more like your um, pure length alternation and less like your grade three, grade one, grade three alternation in some sense. Okay, uh, here's Morella's question. Um, now Anderson has somewhat abandoned this in recent, oh, so, oh, oh, this, this really is a long. Um, um, although Anderson has abandoned this in recent years, the original grade system, as in Anderson 1993, um, which is derived from the transitive verb system, necessitated a length alternation between grade one and grade two slash three. Grade two slash three were always one more longer than grade one. This was true for a short stem alternating between short and mid uh, and a long stem alternating between mid and long. I'm oh, sorry. Um, we've got, I think some of us are using short, long and over long and you're using short, mid and long and this is gonna, this is really gonna mess people up. And particularly in where there's a mid tone, so mid is really bad to use. Um, okay. yeah, yeah. So I, I, I would suggest you do, do like the rest of us. Yeah, anyway, okay. um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so yeah, so in, in, in Anderson's original system, you know, whether you had one, you know, orthographic one vowel, orthographic two vowels, you shifted one to the right in going from grade one to grade two, three. Um, as you just noted, they are related to one another, the two grade, the grade two and three, not defined, the, oh, sorry, the, the grade and length, not defined by themselves. For the nouns, analyzing based on the grade system, including length, can also get rid of some of the ambiguities. For example, between grade one, grade three, um, in um, ah roots, such as in vowel ah roots, such as liver. The reduced version of the grade system seen in your handout and in Anderson 2014 does not have a length difference between grade one and grade two. They are identical. Um, although in his earlier version, they were, the grade and length went hand in hand. Um, so how might this affect the analysis? That is, apologies for the crude formulation, what happens with your analysis if the length alternation is required for the grade system? How is this different from additionally po postulating what you do for grade two suffixes that they add a mora? I recognize this is a complex discussion. Happy to discuss further. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I, th I think ultimately I, I should definitely, let me, yeah, I should definitely make sure we include some discussion of this. Um, I think ultimately it would not be different in the sense that I mean, if you're assuming a kind of moraic representation of length, then if you would always want to say that um, you would have one more there. Um, I mean, the way in which we are kind of thinking about this is in a terms, terms of a sort of auto-segmental theory of floating affixes, where the grade, the grade two assimilation effects are basically associated with a floating feature of some sort, a kind of Underspecified, underspecified vowel affix. Um, and so, I mean, if you, I think you could conceptualize the grade the way Anderson did, the grade the way Anderson did originally or the way that, that we do here, but in both kinds of uh, systems, you would say that that vowel is associated with, with a mora um, by virtue of being a vowel, um, it, it contributes length. So um, I don't necessarily, I think, you know, we are proposing one representation for this affix as a floating uh, feature that, or an underspecified vowel of some sort that has a, a, a length property. So, um, yeah, I think ultimately that analysis is going to, if you translating the grades into um, a, that kind of uh, autosegmental theory is going to look the same regardless of whether you take the original Anderson description or the updated Anderson description. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I, I mean, I think what we really are saying is that all these things are going together. We very much are putting all of these in the same uh, affix, including the low tone as well. Yeah, in this kind of view, I mean, the grade two and grade three affixes are sort of underspecified vowels that have 
a lot of the properties that other vowels do, they have length and they have tone. Um, they just end up integrated into the root. Um, yeah, I would point out that in um, Irina Monich's and my um, uh, uh, treatment of the, the, the noun system in, um, in, in Nuer, the, the equivalent of grade three um, also uh, necessarily adds, I mean, it goes hand in hand with the length alternation. Well, there are length alternations that happen um, uh, independently. Uh, of the grade alternation. So that, but as in your system too, you've got that separate class. Um, Tatiana Reed asks, how will you explain the failure of the, um, the stems to change vowel grade? So I think the question is with respect to um, the ones that have pure lengthening without a grade change. Yeah. Is that the question? I mean, I think that there are there are maybe multiple questions here. Analytically, those are either going to be grade three forms in our system where they length where they lengthen to a, a, a long vowel or mid vowel, regardless, depending on your terminology. <laughs> um, in or they're going to be long over long singulars, which we're now going to call them. Um, uh, depend so depending on their their um, what they do analytically. Uh, in terms of the vowel grades, we haven't proposed, if, if we're thinking of these as, I mean, one question in terms of the chain shift that's occurring in the grades is why you get a one step change all the time and why um, the odd doesn't change. Um, there are a variety of theories of chain shifts. Um, we haven't really thought too much yet about which one of those we want to adopt if that's what you're if that's what the question is asking about which I'm which maybe maybe I'm ask, answering our own question here um, oh actually um, um, uh, Tatiana uh, clarifies the prefix forms well the prefix forms um, so but they I mean the prefix forms fall into different they're mostly in, in grade two um, but or at least grade two is mostly, uh, has a lot of on nouns in it, but they, they occur in different grades. So you can get grade three on nouns like here. So the, the, the presence or absence of the a uh, prefix is independent of the other yeah. inflection class properties of the, the base. Yeah, and I think that kind of follows from the idea that these are maybe underlyingly still floating affixes if you think that they're underlyingly suffixes. So. Uh, you're still really dealing with you're dealing with a sort of underspecified suffix that inter integrates into the root, and so the idea would be that it doesn't affect a just because it's closest to the uh, final syllable. Um, that would be the idea, I think, if that's the if that's the question. I. Oh yeah, it's a good point. I guess. Um, actually. Um... Uh, may not, this may not be the forum to discuss it, but um, uh, one of the things Tatiana is working on right now is um, uh, the corresponding class of nouns in Nuer, which lack uh, a prefix, but um, have, it's, they have a kind of liaison effect. So they induce lengthening on a preceding um, uh, open syllable but otherwise are unprefixed. It reminds me a little bit of the Shaluk floating quantity effect. It's, 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 it is, but in the other direction. Right, okay. Yeah. That's cool. it's, it's, but it's basically the same thing, yeah. Um, do we have any more questions from the um, invisible? I'm, I'm used to I'm used to Zoom like Zoom meetings. Having like, like this invisible audience is really a bit um, unsettling. Uh, do we have any more questions from the invisible audience? Um, no, looks like we don't. Um, um, I think it's now time to thank you. This is really this is a really good, great discussion and. Um, um, yeah, I'm glad to have been able to be a part of it. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I was very, um, very happy to have 
being able to get your your um, discussion and, and questions and, and feedback. And also thank you to the audience for some really great questions. Hey, thank you very much, both Kofi and Matthew, for your collaboration with the series of Rallying Al Vivo. I'd like, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to continue watching our, our live lectures. Uh, Kofi, would you like to say a few words before we, we end the transmission? Just thank you to everybody that, um, that tuned in, You're the invisible audience out there. Um, if you have any more questions, do feel free to get in touch and um, the handout is on the is on my website as well. If you if you missed me saying that in the beginning, uh, if you want to look at any more detail, um, then thank you. Thank you, Kopi, once again. Thank